John Bunyan was a, a pastor who lived in the mid-1600s. I've illustrated often from his writing. Because of his biblical convictions, he would be sent to jail on several occasions for preaching as an unauthorized pastor. And while serving time, he would end up writing several books. His most famous one, published in 16. 78 was entitled, uh, The Pilgrim's Progress from This World to That Which is to Come, shortened now to Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read it, I recommend that you do. It's an extensive allegory where Bunyan writes about the experiences of a Christian. In fact, that's his name. He comes to faith there at the cross, he heeds the warning that he's living in, in a city that will be judged. And he takes off and begins his journey toward the celestial city, which is heaven. His experiences along the way essentially reflect the trials and temptations of every Christian. But John Bunyan includes in this allegory himself and reflects his own struggle primarily with his reoccurring battle <clears throat> over doubt. In one particular episode, a Christian and hopeful, his traveling companion, are traveling uh, through a field, and uh, they spend the night there out in the open asleep, only to be rudely awakened the next morning, captured by the giant uh, despair who takes them to his doubting castle and throws them into a prison cell. Over the course of several days, they are beaten regularly by the giant despair who enjoys making their lives miserable. Finally, one night, Christian and Hopeful are praying for help and and Christian remembers that when he had come to the cross early on and that burden of sin had fallen off his shoulders into the abyss, he had been given a key called promise. He remembers it at that moment and he pulls that key from his pocket and slips it into the lock of their cell door and it opens. He then uses the key again and again as they work their way to the outer edges of the castle. Finally, they reach the outer gate and it opens as well, although Bunyan, in, in wonderful realism, writes that that final gate was stubborn and hard to give way. But finally it did, and they ran for their lives back onto the king's highway. John Bunyan was revealing with transparency what every honest Christian I know acknowledges. A struggle at times with the giant despair. And those moments when you feel incarcerated in doubting castle. Even William Carey, another man I illustrate often from his writings, the man called the founder of modern missions. I mean, how great would that be? Used wonderfully in India, planting churches, starting schools. In fact, that country's first university. He writes this in 1794. I am defective in all my duties. In prayer I wander. I soon tire. My devotion languishes. My soul is a jungle when it ought to be a garden. I am perhaps the most inconsistent Christian. I can scarcely tell if I have the grace of God or not. That's what it feels like in Doubting Castle. Warren Wearsby writes, it's un it isn't unusual even for great spiritual leaders to have their days of doubt and uncertainty. Moses wanted to quit, as did Elijah and Jeremiah. Thomas would doubt the resurrection, and most of the disciples would leave after Jesus' death. But then he adds this really insightful comment. He says this, and I put it on the screen so you can just see it as well as hear it. There is a difference between doubt 
and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind and emotions when we cannot understand what God is doing or why He's doing it. But unbelief is a matter of the will. The will that refuses to believe God's Word no matter what He says or does. One more quote on the subject. This one from Oswald Chambers who wrote, Doubt is not always a sign that a believer is wrong. It might be a sign that he is thinking and thinking deeply. And what he or she needs at that moment is encouragement and a reminder of the key of promise, which is God's Word. I want to show you that lived out in the life of a great spiritual leader who is now languishing in a literal dungeon, accompanied by despair and doubt. He happens to be the last Old Testament prophet, and he's in prison because he courageously told King Herod that he was sinning in having taken his own brother's wife as his own. And of course, that wife isn't going to appreciate that sermon, and she grows to hate him with a vengeance. In a matter of months, she'll succeed, at least earthly speaking, and his head will be delivered to her on a platter. It seems that she's won. We know better. Well, I want to go to John's prison cell where he has been incarcerated, and let's learn some things about overcoming Doubting Castle. We're in Luke's Gospel. If you're new to our study, let's back up here to verse 14 and get a running start to sort of set the scene as Jesus interrupts this funeral. Then he, Jesus, came up and touched the bier, and the pallbearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him, Jesus, spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Now, at verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and and John calling two of his disciples uh, to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, these are John's words. This is John's question, by the way. They're commissioned by John. Here's John's question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, let's understand just a little background before we, you know, accuse John of utter faithlessness. John had lived his entire life in the outdoors. Uh, His diet had been locusts and, and honey. He wore a rough tunic made of camel's hair with a leather belt. He probably tanned himself. Uh, He would rather be outdoors than anywhere. In fact, we have no occasion of hearing that he preached in a synagogue or indoors at any time. He's been incarcerated now for a year and a half, about 18 months. He's in a prison cell located in the fortress of Machaerus near the coast of the Dead Sea, It's a desolate place. In fact, the ruins of this castle and dungeon remain to this day, complete with iron hooks in the walls. Can't imagine a more discouraging place than this castle dungeon. John has evidently grown disillusioned, confused, discouraged during this year and a half. I mean, just think for a moment with me of all that he expected. He had preached that the golden age of the kingdom of God was dawning, right? He was the one who had introduced Jesus. 
He announced, here he is, the Lamb of God, but he also preached. He's got a winnowing fork in his hand, and he's going to separate the chaff. He's going to burn it in fire. That's a picture of the the wrath and judgment of God. That's what Jesus is going to do. Luke chapter 3 is where we studied his sermon. So now, a year and a half later, where's the fire? Where's the wrath of God? Where's the conquering king? Where's the dawning of the golden age? Herod is still on the throne, looks to me. Rome is still in charge. Those religious hypocrites are still, you know, running the temple, the black market. What in the world is going on? See, we often overlook the fact that at this point in time, you and I happen to know more about the prophetic timeline with our completed Bibles than John could have ever imagined. We know now that his announcement and the coming of that fire has been separated now at least 2,000 years. He would have never imagined that, nor did any prophet in the Old Covenant. The church was unknown to them. And keep in mind as well that he struggled with the identity even after he'd been all through all he had been through, but so did the disciples. Consider the fact that Peter's great declaration that Jesus is the Son of God arrives, comes from his mouth after John is dead. So let's not be too hard on him. In fact, if you've ever been in a place in your life Maybe you're there right now where you're wondering, what in the world is is God doing or where in the world did God go? I want you to remember John when none of this made sense to him. So eventually he sends two of his disciples. He says, hey guys, I want you to go find Jesus and, and, and I want you to ask him one question. And I want you to hear, because I do, in this question, just pathos, just raw emotion. It makes you want to weep when you hear it. Are you the expected one? Or are we to expect, you could translate it, someone else? Isn't that what creates the iron bars in Doubting Castle, what we expected. God is doing something in your life that you didn't expect. God is not doing something in your life that you would expect. In fact, God isn't doing anything that you expected in your life. None of it makes any sense. And, and, and you can almost hear that, that those bars on, on that gate swinging shut and just clanking. And there you are. Where is God? James Montgomery Boyce, writing on this text in his commentary, said, you know, we don't necessarily arrive at a point where we doubt that God is love. We just doubt that he loves us. How can I believe, Boyce writes, he loves me when I have lost my job or when my spouse leaves me for someone else or when I am diagnosed with a surprising, incurable disease? These are the times when I do not feel that God loves me or that he even cares about me at all. Uh, I'm so grateful that, that God was transparent enough in the record of Scripture that he gives us this conversation. I mean, I would have probably ended it back with John's fiery sermon, period, and he moves off the scene. This is it. These are his last words. Are you it? Did I go wrong? This doesn't make any sense. Should I look for someone else? And I'm glad because 
we would assume that someone like John would have the answers. I mean, this is the guy to whom doubters should go. If you got a question, go to John. He's the greatest prophet ever. He should know. He's the one asking. Jesus responds here in verse 22, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. (laughs) By the way, don't miss the point that Jesus does not tell them You go back and tell John, I'm ashamed of you. I mean, you're a prophet of God. Why in the world are you saying, how could you say, should I be looking for someone else? I mean, after all you've been through, you announced me, you introduced me, you baptized me, you saw the dove come down, you heard the voice of my Father from heaven. What more could I do for you? You're questioning No, Jesus, in his response here, I love this, just simply says, well, let's just go over the promises again. See, what Jesus does in this response is deliver four different texts from the prophet Isaiah. In fact, passages that John had preached. And it's like Jesus says, well, let me just give you the key again. Well, you've had it. Let me remind you, it's in your, in your pocket. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19, the dead shall rise, their bodies shall live. Isaiah 29, 18, in that day the deaf shall hear. Isaiah 35, verse 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the poor shall have the gospel preached to them. Jesus is essentially saying, John, remember, remember the promise. I'm it. I'm doing it. Your disciples are seeing it. It's taking place. It's happening. It's not on your timetable. It's going to be different than what you expected. But but the promises are true. And then he says here in verse 23, this last word to John, his last words to him are, are tender. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You could translate that and paraphrase it to mean, John, you will sense the blessing of being related to me, following me, if you don't trip over, stumble over, become embittered or annoyed at my timetable. That'll keep you locked in. Evidently, these quotations from Isaiah, while they did not set John physically free, they set his mind and heart free. He remained faithful until his death. Now, just in case somebody in the crowd might get the idea that Jesus is rebuking John... Jesus sets the record straight with an amazing tribute. He reminds the crowd that when they went out to hear uh, John preach, what was he? He wasn't a reed shaking in the wind, verse 24. That is, he wasn't a man yielding to popular opinion without any conviction, was he? Verse 25, Jesus says, John wasn't bending under the pressure of, of you know, the, the, the powerful and, and the rich He couldn't be bribed. He wasn't wasn't going to be pampered, softened by the luxuries of life. Jesus says to the crowd here in verse 26, John was the prophet of God. And by the way, not just any prophet. He goes on to notice, you'll notice the quotation. That's from Malachi chapter 3 and and verse 1. He came to introduce the Messiah, the coming king. So John wasn't just any prophet you went out there to hear. He was the final prophet. 
a unique prophet of God. But then notice the encouragement Jesus adds here in verse 28. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one that is among you who is least in the kingdom of God, weakest, smallest, is greater than he. Just as Thomas was blessed by believing in the resurrected Lord only after he saw him. You remember what Jesus said? You know, how much more blessed is is the one who believes in me having never seen? We don't feel more blessed. Frankly, I'd like to see him. But he said we are. Now he says, you know, John has seen all the evidence and all of these signs, but how much greater is your faith? John saw me. John baptized me. John heard a voice from heaven. I'd kind of like that. He says, no, your faith is greater because you've never heard that voice audibly or seen Jesus face to face. Well, with that, the crowd is buzzing, they're immediately polarized, and on one hand, you have all the sinners, you know, all those tax collectors and people that are readily admitting they are sinners. We're told here in verse 29, they went out, they were immersed by John, demonstrating their repentance, admitting they're sinners. On the other hand, you got all these religious leaders that would never admit they're sinners, so they're not about to be baptized by John, the prophet, with his symbol of repentance, which is immersion out here in Jordan. So Jesus now turns to the crowd of unbelievers, and he he delivers a rather pointed message. Verse 31, and yes, we're covering more verses than we've ever covered in my lifetime and yours. So just keep going with me here, all right? Don't slow the train down. Verse 31, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? What are you unbelievers like out here? He says, you're childish. That's what he means. You're sitting in the marketplace calling to one another, let's play a game. We played a flute for you. You did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. What Jesus is doing is comparing the unbelievers to childish little babies, as it were. They're playing their games, but then they don't get it. You know, they're not happy. You're not playing the way I want you to play it. I'm going to change the rules. I don't want to play that game. Whether it's girls playing house or or boys playing cowboys and Indians before the time it was when we knew that would be politically incorrect to play that game so we don't play that anymore. (laughs) I don't want to play that game anymore. I shot you. You didn't fall down. I got you. No, I quit. I don't like this game anymore. One author said the text reminded him of the time when he was growing up, one of the boys in the neighborhood always made the rest of us kids play his special brand of baseball. We had to use his rules, and that was because he owned the bat. So if you didn't play the way you wanted, give me my bat, I'm going home. See, Jesus refers to children playing a game in the marketplace, either pretending to be in a funeral or pretending to be in a wedding, And these religious leaders just won't play. Nothing makes them happy. Nothing cheers them up. Nothing is good enough. And verse 33 seems to apply to John being the funeral director. Why? Because his message was doom and gloom. His sign was death to self, immersion. Oh, we we don't believe him. He's got a demon, Jesus says. You said he had a demon. Okay, okay. My ministry began in a wedding, and really it's been a lot of wonderful, joyful occasions since then, one feast after another, healing and resurrections. And, well, he says to them here, you you say I'm a glutton and a drunkard. So on either spectrum, a funeral and a wedding and everything in between, you, you stomp your feet like babies, you can't be satisfied. Wow. I'm sure they love this sermon. Jesus then concludes with this pointed statement. In verse 35, he says, look, you you just need to wait. Be patient. This is more to us than them. 
Wisdom will be justified in the end. The truth will be proven right in the end. Just wait. We're still waiting. 2,000 years later, we're waiting. Generations of believing children are going to grow up and follow true wisdom. Think about it. Even now, millions of people around the globe know the name of Jesus, even though to them it might be a swear word. But I guarantee if you go out there on the sidewalk in this town, you won't find one person that probably even knows one name of one of these religious leaders. So it is already being vindicated in a way. Their problem wasn't doubt. It was unbelief. Doubters have trouble understanding what God is doing. In fact, the fact that that troubles you, you want to know what God is doing, is an indication you care about God. Unbelievers don't care what God's doing, and you don't need to tell me. I'm not interested in what God's doing. I'm not interested in God. There's a vast difference. In 1887, Henry Drummond wrote on this text, Jesus doesn't fail to distinguish doubt from unbelief. Doubt is honest. Unbelief is obstinate. Doubt is looking for the light it knows exists Unbelief denies the light and is content to stay in the dark. While most people are familiar with Doubting Castle and Pilgrim's Progress, the first book actually written by John Bunyan when he was imprisoned 12 years earlier is lesser known. I also recommend you read it. It's called Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. It's just a little paperback, about 60 pages. This is his spiritual autobiography. And again, one of the recurring themes in this little book is his struggle with doubt and discouragement. It repeatedly leads you back to the key of promise, which is the Word of God. Let me read you just a little paragraph from this as we begin to land this plane. We're not landing it quite yet, but... We see the runway just ahead. He he writes this. I had no sooner begun to recall my experiences of the goodness of God than there came flooding into my mind the remembrance of my sins, especially my coldness of heart, my weariness in doing good, my lack of love for God, His ways, His people, And along with these sins came this question, are these the fruits of a true Christian? I became sick in my inward man. And my experiences of God's goodness were taken from my mind as though they had never existed. As I was walking up and down in my house in the most dreadful state of mind, The promise of God came to my heart. You are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24. You are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What a promise and what a turn this made that day upon me. Oh, what a change it made. Have you ever thought about the fact that John's disciples never came back to Jesus in the weeks that he had left? After delivering these verses to John from the book of Isaiah, at this point in his life, That was enough. And I want to tell you that you and I escape Doubting Castle time and time the same way. 
not by some heroic, you know, deed, not by some heroic act of faith where we kill the giant. Let me tell you, that giant's going to chase you and me all the way to the celestial city. (laughs) Expect that. We don't we don't overcome it by some inner determination. I'm gonna I'm gonna get better. Yeah, we want to please him. Like Paul, our ambition is to please the Father. It grieves us when we don't. No, we escape by reaching again and again for the key, which is the word of God. Helplessly, weakly, we reach again. Beloved, don't forget to use your key. So are you learning this key? Are you memorizing this key? Are you praying this key? Are you a close friend of this key? Is it close to you, as it were, in your pocket? as you walk with Christ. One author, after reading John Bunyan's writings, wrote this prayer many years ago. I have already prayed it for you today. Here it is, and with this I close. Lord, we pray for every believer caught by despair, who struggles in grief, locked in doubting castle's dungeon, stripped of hope and its relief. Father, help them to remember that your promise is the key that unlocks the cell that holds them and by your truth sets them free.